Thank you. Last week, um, if you were here, we started a series. We're going to look at four weeks on the way um, Jesus... Well, that just skipped something. Whoops. The way um, Jesus did so much of his ministry around the table. He was either a guest or a host um, at many, many dinner parties. And um, Phil said last week, and he was right, that about 20% of the Gospel of Luke sees Jesus doing his teaching um, or his serving at a table. And the table was very, it is still today, but then it was very, very profound. It was very deep in meaning. It wasn't just like, yeah, let's eat together. There was this profound meaning that came when we ate with somebody. There was this sacred bond. It reflected unity, acceptance, inclusion when someone was invited to dinner or was sat at the table with you. And similarly, it meant rejection and isolation if you refused to eat with someone. And it's pretty much the same today, isn't it? If I want to deepen a relationship with a friend or get to know someone, I generally will invite them for coffee or dinner or um, if I want to deepen a business relationship and and sell something to someone, I'm going to do it over a meal. There's a sense of relationship involved in that and it's important. And three times that Jesus is invited to a dinner party in the Gospel of Luke, he's invited to the home of a Pharisee or of Pharisees. And one of those was read to us early, so earlier, so beautifully by Erin. And she read it in a more modern um, paraphrase. Paraphrase says, woe to you, which woe is like disaster to you. You bring disaster upon yourself when you do these things. And I was quite, I don't know how you felt at the end of that reading, but I kind of felt like I wanted to get up and say, but it's okay, it's going to be okay. You know, it was all a bit tense and scary and it went on and on and, and woe, woe, woe to you Pharisees who do this. And so Jesus did a lot of his teaching and rebuking and challenging around the table. Now, it's important for us to know when understanding about these Pharisees is that they were, um, meals were really important to them, okay? So they were kind of, um, had all these rules that they decided was going to be acceptable and they would tithe on their food, they would make sure they were pure, they were pure, and they would also um, be really scrupulous about their table manners. And so sometimes they would actually not quite tithe appropriately, and that seemed to be okay. And much of the time, they weren't exactly pure, but their table manners were non-negotiable. The outside stuff, the stuff that people could see in these important settings of dinners, were absolutely unnegotiable. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, you might know him, Mahatma Gandhi, he is the Indian pacifist. You don't know him, but you might have read about him. And I, I studied him at one stage in my life. And he actually... Um, a lot of his philosophy of life is based on the Sermon of the Mount. I don't know if you know that. But he, he read about Christ, both in the Bible and by lots of Christian authors. And he, he was fascinated by the, the, by the life of Christ. And so he, just, he, he exudes this sort of Sermon on the Mount sort of teaching. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will inherit the earth, that kind of thing. But he never made a commitment to actually become a Christian, obviously. He lived with Christians in lots of parts of the world, in England, in South Africa, in India, and he expected these Christians to display these characteristics that he heard taught in the life of Christ. But he didn't. He didn't experience that at all. And one day he was asked by a Christian missionary, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming a Christian? And his reply was clear. He said, Oh, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It is just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ, I fear he makes no difference. So many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ, I fear he makes no difference. I would propose today that perhaps the greatest threat to Christianity is what Jesus refers to in this reading as dirty dishes and unmarked graves. They were code words, if you like, or phrases to describe hypocrisy. Jesus uses the, these phrases to say, you guys are being hypocrites, and it's not just affecting you, it's affecting those around you. You know, this might be very well the reason why Jesus addressed it so often. This is just one time, one table conversation he had about hypocrisy. But he took it up regularly with Pharisees and teachers of the law. So who were these Pharisees? Now, some of us have grown up 
in church. Not all of us, but some of us have. And we've heard about these Pharisees for a long time. They were the, like the, the, how would you refer to them? They were the watchdogs of the rules. You know, they made sure the rules that had been implemented were being kept and they kept a really close eye on Jesus. Now, I think the danger to us these days is we've heard about Pharisees, many of us, so often that we know they're the bad guys. When I say the word Pharisee, you think, bad, that's wrong, that's not like me. And we automatically put them in a bit of a category and distance them from ourselves. We can't imagine being tempted with the same things they were tempted with. We can't imagine falling into the same trap that they fell into. We can't imagine that. But that's dangerous thinking. Because the temptations, the traps that the Pharisees fell into are similar ones that we, I, find myself so easily falling into today. At this point in Luke, Luke chapter 11, we see the the Pharisees have already seen Jesus as an enemy. They've not liked the things that he'd been teaching. They haven't liked his popularity. They've thought he was blasphemous. And they were looking for something to do or something that Jesus did to bring a charge against him. They were watching him really closely. And it's almost surprising to me that Jesus then actually accepted this dinner invitation, knowing that they were just waiting to catch him out. But Jesus seemed willing to eat with his enemies. We see Jesus practicing exactly what he'd preached back in Luke 6, where he said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, eat with those who are looking to catch you out. He didn't say that, but that's what he was saying. You know, loving our enemies, I reckon, is one of the most difficult things we can do because it is so counterintuitive. I don't know about you, but I don't like hanging out with my enemies. Who likes hanging out with their enemies? Who likes hanging out with people that don't like them, people that are bringing them down, people that are looking for ways to catch them out? Our natural instinct, isn't it, is to distance ourselves from people that don't like us or that we don't like, to, to stay away from them, maybe not to be you know, verbally abusive to them, but to avoid them. Maybe to talk about them behind our back, about them behind their back. Are we willing to eat with our enemies like Jesus was? Are we willing to dine and dialogue with our enemies, have real conversation with those who we disagree with? Anyway, back to the meal. If you've got your Bibles there, it might be helpful this morning to have a look because I'm not going to read it bit by bit again. We've already had that read to us. But looking at verse 38, we see the, this meal. And Jesus goes to the Pharisee and he goes in and he sits at the table. And what happens? The Pharisee looks at him and is like, what are you doing? Like, you haven't washed your hands. Like, what, what, what's happening? And let me tell you, he wasn't concerned about Jesus' hygiene. He wasn't saying, haven't you read the studies that say, you know, you need to wash your hands before you eat with your hands and put your hands in your mouth? He wasn't concerned about Jesus contracting some sort of bacterial disease. In reality, the hand washing wasn't even like a proper washing. They didn't use soap or scrub. It was actually like a sprinkling of water. Very ineffective. Nothing at all like when you go into hospitals or anything and see the how to wash your hands and there's the whole thing. It was literally just like a sprinkle of water. It was a ceremonial act. There was no type of physical cleansing actually happening at all. I want to tell you, Jesus wasn't breaking any rules that God had implemented. Jesus didn't break the rules that were implemented in the Old Testament. These were extra biblical rules. These were rules that the Pharisees put on top of the Bible rules in order just to make sure that they were going to be okay. There was like a thousand and one extra rules that they imposed on everyone and then watched to make sure they kept them. The only thing Jesus violated was a man-made rule, which they decided was appropriate for religious conduct. You know, as Christians today, we need to be really careful to tell the difference between the laws of our God and our own personal preferences. We may have all kinds of opinions about things like what people ought to wear, where they should eat, how they should spend their money, how they should run their household, what political position they should take. We may even believe there are good spiritual reasons for our opinion. The Pharisees had good reasons for the extra rule and They weren't just random. They thought they were really doing the right thing. And we too need to be so careful that we're proper, properly distinguishing between the commands of God and our own personal code of conduct. Now, legalism is lethal, lethal to the gospel of grace. 
And although Jesus does make requests on our lives, hear me and I'll get there today, he does make requests on our moral behaviour. It's not a religion. Christianity is not a religion about rules and regulations, but it's about relationship with Jesus, about a relationship with Jesus, standing on his blood and his righteousness alone. Whatever we do, let's not kill the gospel by pushing our own personal agendas. So God, Jesus goes on to talk at the table. And we're going to take a little bit of a moment to have a look at some of the topics of his table talk. But before we, before we launch right in, and launching right in is the end bit, so I don't get stressed. It's not going to go forever this morning. Oh. Have a think about the way Jesus handled this situation. Now, he'd had these things in his mind a long time, I'm sure. He didn't just make all this stuff up off the top of his head. He knew about their behaviour. But do you see where he took the most of an opportunity to actually deal with this behaviour? Notice what he didn't do. He didn't post poisonous remarks on his Facebook page. He didn't write a letter to the editor of the Jerusalem Times denigrating the Pharisees and their behaviour. He didn't gossip behind their backs to everybody else about, look what those Pharisees are doing. He confronted them directly. He took his issues right to the source. He laid out his objections at the table, face to face, heart to heart. And sure, Jesus had some harsh words for these Pharisees and the teachers of the law, harsh words, but he still practiced courtesy and courage and civility. We certainly have a lot to learn from Jesus in this regard, don't we? When we have a conflict with someone, instead of avoiding the issue or gossiping behind their backs or publicly ridiculing them, not even individuals, I'm thinking of groups of people that get ridiculed sometimes, why don't we sit down with our enemies, buy them a coffee or lunch, lay out our issues on the table, sending angry emails, passive-aggressive Facebook posts, strips away humanity from the confrontation. So we see with Jesus, face-to-face, table talk, nothing beats it. And then he, he launches in at the right opportunity to share what's on his heart, his concerns about their behaviour. And he used, he, he used the opportunity to respond to something that they said. So the Pharisee's like, look, you're not washing. You're not washing your hands. What's going on? I'm, I'm shocked. I'm a and I'm, I'm picturing him sitting there at the table, and we don't know this for sure, and there's probably a cup or dish there on the table where he is. And he says, you Pharisees, here you are with a cup, or bowl, he might have said, here you are, cl- you clean the outside of the cup, but you ignore the inside. In the inside, you're full of greed and wickedness. Did you hear how the ma- message um, put it? Your insides are maggoty with greed and secret evil. Doesn't sound very appealing, does it? It's a pretty disgusting image. We recently went camping, and um, it's pretty basic camping. Like, there's no power and everything. You've got to walk ages to get dishwashing water to carry back, and you wash a few dishes, and it's grimy and gross. And so you kind of, you know by the end of the week, the dishes need a really good washing. But as you're making do, like, one night, Phil said, oh, make me coffee. And I'm like, oh, the cup's dirty. And he's like, just clean the inside. You know, just rinse out the inside so the outside's a bit dirty and muddy. But we're just making sure the inside's clean enough. So you can put up with a cup that's a little bit dirty on the outside, as long as your mouth's not going to touch it. But the inside, that bit needs to be clean. That's the bit you're going to waste water rinsing out, aren't you? Like, you, it's common sense. How do you clean a cup? I don't know about you. I remember the days where I washed up. We've only not washed up for about six years. And what would you do? You'd get the cup. This is how my mum taught me anyway. And you'd start with the inside, with the cloth, while it was still clean, the inside, then the rim where people put their mouth, and then the outside was last. The inside is so much more important than anything else. No one cleaned the outside of the cup first. That was crazy. You know, the Pharisees had this great public image or they thought they did, they tried to have. They appeared holy and good and righteous because they obeyed rules. They loved to be seen. They wanted people to know about their good works. They wanted people to know they were fasting. They wanted people to know they were giving generously, giving accurately. But God could see their insides were full of pride and selfishness. You know, a sure sign our cup is not clean is when we think, but no one knows all the good stuff I'm doing for God. No one can see the way I'm serving. I don't don't feel appreciated. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, good. 
<laughs> Good. Matthew 6, 2. Don't let people know what you are doing because then you have received your reward. Our aim is to always keep the attention placed on Jesus and not on us. If we're missed, Jesus says, good. Now, Jesus goes on to give examples to, the, to these Pharisees of how they are being hypocritical. Three examples of ways they are bringing disaster upon themselves. And in the first one, he gets at their greed. Sure, they tithe their income. They even like um, up the amount of herbs they grew in their garden to make sure they tithed exactly on the herbs in their garden. That's how like, meticulous they were. They were focusing on the minors, but forgetting the major things that were in the gospel, that were in the Bible. They were so obsessed about getting the arithmetic right to make sure tithing was right on that they lost sight of love for God and justice for their neighbour. Jesus says, tithing's important. But what about love and what about justice? What about these big ticket items? Verse 42, I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you Pharisees, frauds. You keep meticulous account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get, but manage to find loopholes for getting around basic matters of justice and God's love. Careful bookkeeping is commendable. You're doing the right thing. What, what you do, what the outside is matters, but not as much as the inside, the basics are required. You know, greed isn't always apparent on the outside, and it's about the heart, and only we know that before God, the way that we give, the way that we love, the way that we seek justice and mercy. Only we know that. He goes on to point out their pride. The Pharisees appeared holy because they never missed a worship service, and maybe some of you are sitting here today ticking off saying, oh, look at all those young people missing, but I'm still here. Yep, I'm doing good. Underneath, though, they desired the best seats so that they were seen. What was the point of coming to a worship service if you couldn't be seen? What's the point of sitting in the back row hiding, even though from here I can see the back row better than any row, just by the way? (laughs) They looked for VIP treatment wherever they went. You know, it was as if their religion was based on the approval of others. If others approved, then of course God would approve is the way they thought. And I wonder whether you're challenged a bit like I am this morning about whether I care more about what others think than about living for an audience of one. Do we care more about what others think than about what God thinks? You know, Jesus was unwilling just to do that ritual hand-washing thing just to appease man. He knew that true religion came from the heart. And so Jesus didn't just go with the flow. But I wonder today whether some of us are more concerned about fitting in, going with the flow, rather than about doing what's right with God's, by God's standards. So Jesus hassled, not hassled, paid out, not paid out, what's the word? Disaster will come upon you if you're greedy, if you're prideful. And he really got to the heart of the matter when he said, woe to you if you're a bad influence. You know, Jesus compares the Pharisees to unmarked graves, which was really accusing them of being a corrupting influence. Selling people is the word that they used. In Numbers 19, 16, if we need to understand a little bit about the history of this, but basically Moses records that touching a grave or a dead body made you unclean for seven days. So just so that graves really stood out, it was made sure that they were marked and they were whitewashed so that people knew to avoid them. You know, if if the grave is unmarked and there's nice and green grass over it, you might accidentally become defiled. So marking them, whitewashing them, made them stand out so that you would know to avoid. So when Jesus calls them unmarked graves, he's saying people are coming into contact with you and not realising how bad you are, not realising what a bad influence this is, not realising that they're defiling themselves by learning your bad ways. You're like unmarked graves. People come in contact with you. They get corrupted, but they don't know it. You're a bad influence. You're not helping people spiritually. You're defiling them because the inside of your cup is so dirty. You know, when we act selfishly, when we don't speak or act towards each other with love and godliness, we're defiling or corrupting people with our attitude. When we lack a passion for God and his church, when we're a negative influence, we are corrupting people. 
We confuse people because our lives don't match up with the teaching of Jesus. I love your Christ, but I just don't think he makes a difference in your life. May that never be said about us. So Jesus leveled these rebukes at the Pharisees. And then the lawyers, the the, um, teachers of the law were there as well. And he realized that actually you're saying that to them. You know, they were feeling a little bit convicted. You're insulting us too. And Jesus is like, yep, that's the point. And so he basically says, okay, here's, here's some specifics for you as well. And he launched into three more woes or rebukes against them as well. He criticised them for loading the people down with extra laws that they didn't need, with moral burdens. The teachers of the law were guilty, he said, of rebelling against God's word themselves. Jesus accused these lawyers of knowing the truth and not speaking it, of understanding the word and not actually letting other people in on the secret, keeping it to themselves. And he said that was one of the worst forms of hypocrisy. And Jesus had no problem shining a light on it. You know, Jesus is really good at shining the light on hypocrisy if we let him. His word is still alive today. His word is a light to our feet. His word shines light on our unclean hearts. And you know, sometimes it's real uncomfortable. Table convert Jesus is often uncomfortable. If you read through the Gospel of Luke, and if you haven't done it recently, do it. It's very uncomfortable. Very. You know, even in recent days, as I've sat with Jesus over coffee, I don't think it's possible to study God's word without a coffee. It probably is. But as I've I've studied his word, allowed him to search my heart, he's challenged me about parts of my life that are less than helpful. And that's the purpose of his word. His purpose of his word, the light, is to shine light on our darkness so that we can deal with it, or more accurately, we can allow him to deal with it. He's rebuked me for the times that I've put expectations on others that I think that they should do because I do it. Are we prepared to ask these sort of questions of ourselves? I think they're going to... Do I ever try to make myself look better than I actually am? Do I ever try to appear generous, but actually have a heart of greed? Do I expect to be treated better than others because of my status or position, or maybe how clever I am, or how good looking, or how talented? Are my actions or inactions a stumbling block for someone else? Now, I would propose this morning that to some degree we are all hypocrites. And this is precisely why we have a need for Jesus. Why we need to sit at the table with Jesus. Why we need a perfect saviour to show us our failings and provide the grace to overcome them. This is the good news of the gospel. This is hung on the cross for our hypocrisy, for the fact that we couldn't take care of our own stuff. He is the way to be cleansed from the inside out. Hebrews 10:22 says, "Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled, not our hands, our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience." Sin can't be dealt with in a superficial way like the Pharisees thought. The Pharisees didn't understand sin, they kept on coming up with wrong ways to deal with it. But what about me? What about you? Can we really say, I know my sins? Lord, I'm unclean. Only you can clean me from the inside out. 1 Samuel 16, 7, a well-known verse. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, and just because we focus on the inside doesn't mean the outside should stay dirty, the outside should be corrupt, the outside should be immoral. In fact, when Matthew writes about this same conversation that Jesus had at the table, here's what he said, Matthew 23, 26. He says, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. It's about the focus. We focus on the outside, 
We're going to stay unclean on the inside. But if we focus on the inside, then the outside will be clean as well. Then God will search our hearts. He'll convict us. He'll challenge us. And our behaviours will change. Is Christ enough for you this morning? I wonder, as we sing this morning, we're going to sing the song, Christ is Enough. And I wonder whether God wants to do a little bit in your life today. And you might want to stand and sing this song. You might want to stand and just speak to God. You might want to come and kneel at the place of prayer this morning and just ask God, God, is there something in me that is unhelpful to me or to others? I want to be pure before you. And I know that doesn't come by doing the right things. I know it comes from allowing you to search my heart and to cleanse me from the inside. So this morning as we sing this, I just ask that you listen to the Holy Spirit's movement in your life. You don't need to hear the words that I've said this morning. You need to hear God speak to you to reveal whatever he needs to reveal. Christ is enough. Is Christ enough? I invite you to stand.